Hey folks, it's Tommy Z back with you again today. We have a special guest with us and a friend of mine, industry friend, um, who is hailing from Toronto, Canada. Uh, we have with us Dave Sorbara. Do I pronounce your last name right? You got it. Nice. So Dave is uh, actually an industry veteran uh, because he is the founder and partner of one of the premier music production companies in Toronto called Grayson. And he's also the founder of a recent initiative, which is called the Signal Creative Community. So just like I'm trying to scratch my restless itch of doing something to motivate myself after 15 years of delivering commercials at the highest levels. And now I'm trying to mentor some new folks. Dave is doing something similar, trying to find a way to empower musicians uh, today in interesting and innovative ways. And we're going to talk about that. The first thing I want to ask you is, how did you, what was your beginning with music? Like, how did you get into the whole music thing? I love telling this story. Uh, I have to go back to the early 90s, and I really jumped into music. I was a musician myself uh, as a teenager, and really it was the personal computer. And for a lot of people, they'll be like, you know, very few people have a memory of that time, but it was uh, tape machines and outboard gear and large consoles, and I just saw the power of a personal computer. And I just dove in. So it was this merging of technology and music that I got inspired by. So I started by experimenting with computers and, and really showing off what computers did, could do to other artists, musicians at the time. You know, I built studio after studio is, is what it feels like, but it was all really centered around uh, the computer and the possibilities that could be created with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I aspired to open a studio and rent it out and bring artists and uh, very quickly it was it was the realization after I borrowed uh, about a hundred grand to open a studio that paying those bills and driving revenue wasn't going to come from independent artists mainly at the time and so we started looking pretty actively um, for any place that needed music or sound or otherwise where I could leverage my studio and deliver a product. So at the time we were making sound effects for CD-ROMs. We were doing, you know, little uh, documentary film mixes. We were doing little pieces of music for film and television, uh, but really on, on, on a small scale. And it was really um, an introduction to a commercial film director who really got our opened our eyes to the possibility of um, being able to make music for advertising. He was a, a Canadian director, very successful at the time. And um, he took a shiny to us. We had a great couple of dinners and he said, why don't you guys work on some music for content on my director's reel? And, you know, we chomped at the bit and we, we created our own reel using his content and then we shopped it around saying, this is what we do. And here's a director that you guys know well, and he loves our work and you should work with us. Mm -hmm. um, it was funny because we offended a few people because we brought, um, brought in their ads that they had worked on, that he had worked on with our new music on it saying, the music on there was terrible. Ours is way better. <laughs> Which is uh, but it was that, that, a great story because actually like, there's a couple of things in your story that I want to dig into a little deeper. But um, the first thing I want to ask you is like, you said you borrowed a hundred grand to open the studio. Now, what kind of studio was it? Like, tell me about some of the gear it had. What was the time? What was the... So, yeah. So um, it was 1997. That was our opening party. Still remember it well. There was a digital console, two computers, one running eight channels of Pro Tools at the time that was 25 grand. Um, it barely, it barely even had, um, meters in it, uh, running on a, on a Mac 7,200. And then on the left side of the console, we had a PC running some sampling software and Cubase, uh, very little outboard. We had ADAT machines, um, so we could store in a very expensive DAT machine. 
Um, you know, so basically, of- like your idea was, I want to have a studio. I'm just going to make music. Did you have like any idea how you would be paying your bills with it? Like, what was your assumption when you opened my, it? Yeah, my assumption was very, very simple. Um, I was obsessed with making music, and I figured I could inspire people to come and rent our studio. Okay. And that was it. Okay. And so we started by just literally renting it out. But there was still a studio business in the 90s. You could, you could um, as long as you were busy and uh, an owner-operator, you could make a decent wage out of that. Yeah. So that the, the business model said we, we should be able to pay our loans back and, you know, I should be able to, you know, earn a decent living over time. But at some point you realize, hmm, maybe I should think about a different way, right? Yeah, a, di- a, a, different, a different angle. Um, and let's um, also be clear at the time, if you wanted to open up a professional studio, I mean, you're talking millions of dollars. Yeah. So at the time the cutting edge version of a studio that could still deliver a professional product you know, for a hundred grand, it's pretty cheap. Yeah. So um, there was people still investing in studios you know, with millions of dollars at the time. So, but for us very, very quickly, and it was a personal um, mission too. It was like, do I really want to be, um, you know, grinding it out, helping other people make music and charging them you know 40 or 50 dollars an hour or do i really want to pave my own way because i had still a huge passion to make music and collaborate with people and i said why not you know build up my own credit and build up my own potential for earning with my own craft than uh, really just supporting other people and then and so that's what that's what turned it so that's what really made me want to focus on now, where else could I leverage this technology and my skill set? Yeah. It's funny how, like, even though you were involved with music and you probably knew everything about the gear and music industry and what's happening, it's funny how many of us didn't ever connect the music for brands thing with <laughs> with our craft. Like, you're saying that you did it almost by accident because, like, a film director you met – introduce you to the world. It was the same for me. A friend of mine introduced me to this world. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why did it take me so long to like, you know, connect the two things that there's music being made uh, on a large scale level for brands and somebody's paying for it and it's good business. And yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we're well aware it's, it's a pretty small community. Um, because you have to deliver at such a high level that um, you have to be made to be able to create content like that and deliver a level of service that brands require. And I think that's why the community is small. Yeah. Um, and small relative to, let's say, the music industry, for example. It's yeah. definitely not small. It's not like there's not a lot of people doing it, but relative to people and what they're making music to put on Spotify, it's, it's yeah, pretty it's small. A hidden world. It's a, yeah. Um, so let's do this exercise. Now you started with two computers, a pro tools rig and like fast forward, how many years has Grayson been in existence? 90s. So officially incorporated in 2000. So now we're 20, probably 22 years, 22 years. So now, paint the picture because I've been to your studio <laughs> yeah. more than two computers with pro yeah. rigs now paint the picture now of what it looks like. And I mean, feel free to humble brag. Yeah. So it's interesting. 22 years we've been now through uh, an officially a global pandemic. Um, we've been through two global recessions. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, business still chugs along because people still need to sell stuff and brands still need to make, make contact. So I wanted to make that point, which is really interesting. We were remarking on that today. Um, you know, as of today, we have all of our staff that have been kept on while we ride this out. Um, so our original, I'll kind of paint a picture of all the studios. Originally, we had a one-room shop in a small building. Uh, then we had a two-room two studio shop in the same building in a different location. Then we built another facility with four rooms. 
And uh, the, the facility that we're in now, we've got over 20 studios, um, including office space, workspace. You know, we do casting, voiceover recording, mixing. Yeah, there's we have 20 studios now. And what's everything your, from yeah. So everything from um, you know surround mixing, um, traditional music, analog studios, writing rooms, um, smaller studios, casting rooms, and you know the complement of lounges and, and workspace. So for, is it fair to say that it's really like pursuing the path of advertising that has really grown this company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's been our bread and butter for for two decades. Um, it's also spawned many sister companies in film and television, in the licensing world. Uh, it allows us to actually pursue more creative endeavors that don't, um, you know, have a huge budget. Yeah. So we'll work on feature film projects and independent film projects based on the fact that we know we can pay our bills with, with brand work and work for. Um, more premium television work which is a key lesson for any musician listening which is like this is how you can do it you can get your advertising work your commercial projects to pay for whatever other initiatives that you want to do to keep yourself alive if your goal is to like be doing music all day you know if you want to divide it up where you have a day job and you just make money that way then you try to work on your music on the side that's fine but I recommend a model whereby you're always doing music, um, whether it's for yourself or for somebody else, because then it's a synergy that's really powerful because you're always learning. You're always with your guitar, with your synth, with your doll, whatever. You're, you're basically a full-time musician. Okay, so 20 studios now. You got how many people on staff these days? Uh, I think we've got 32 staff 32 staff how many did you start with 20 years ago yeah it was me and a partner to begin with and then um we hired a receptionist yeah yeah. That yeah. Was so three people um and now you got um about 30 so uh you can see folks this is a real business like i'm just trying to you know make you realize this and toronto it's my old stomping grounds i mean i'm still there from once in a while but it's a pretty healthy scene as far as uh, the production is concerned. It's definitely the capital of, of advertising in Canada. So um, now I want to take go back again and pick up on something you said, which is that the, f the first way that you tried to spread the word about yourself as a studio was that you took this guy's reel, which included yep. all of these commercials that were already done and they – already had music that was provided by other people, your competitors, essentially. Yeah. And you put your music underneath and you sent it out to what, ad agencies in Toronto? That's right, yeah. And then, uh, like with any probably effective ad campaign or promotional campaign, you probably got some love, but you're saying you also got some hate. So give me a bit of a reflection on that. Would you do that, would you do that again? I think it's, it's, um, you know, I go back to, I mean, we were, how old was I? I was probably 23, very naive with enough energy. We could stay up 24 hours a day and work. Um, uh, you know, getting turned down really had no effect on us. We just kept driving forward. It was a world of cold calls. We were, um, you know, getting rejected happened so much to the point where, one of the first calls we got, I still remember picking up the phone, talking to a producer from an agency who wanted to hire us, and I was confused, very much confused. I'm like, why do you want to hire us? Do we have to do something for free? Like, what is the You're saying the you got here? rejected so much yeah. that essentially when the first call came in that expressed interest, you almost didn't trust it. Yeah, it was, there was no trust in the call. So long story short, um, we actually did the job did a great job on it. We developed a long-standing relationship with the people we worked for on that first job. Um, and our, we priced ourselves at one, less than one quarter of the competition. Oh my God. And you know, that was, that was our, you know, our learning curve. Yeah. Um, but you know, for us, it was, it was a windfall, but as far as the market goes, like I said, we were, 
what well, mind you, it's not something to worry about too much. Like, I'll say two things about that. One is that many companies that enter the ad market, as I watch, like film production companies, let's say, they intentionally price themselves really low, mm-hmm. even though their ambition is to be premier. But they price themselves low so that they get the jobs. And then over time, when they start getting that base of clients, the prices start going up because the level of the work is really good. And then suddenly they're the most expensive option in town. Is that sort of what happened to you? Because I know Grayson to be a premier uh, studio. Like nowadays you wouldn't price yourself lower. You'd probably price yourself at the higher yeah. level. My recommendation is we brought in a partner a couple years after we started and, and we kind of um, really put ourselves on par with everyone else. So starting, you know, price yourself low, unfortunately in an industry, you can very quickly be pegged as a B or C player by pricing yourself too low. Um, So I think you always want to maintain some sense of um, obviously your self-worth, but also as a company saying, no, no, we're competing with the rest of these um, operations that are, competing at a high level. So yeah. we very quickly went from low priced and then overnight we just became high priced and right. nothing really changed. We still got those calls, but I think it's important to, to establish, um, you know, establish yourself as being a premier shop or a premier uh, creative outlet. Yeah. So what would you say are the things, um, and I just want to talk about your music production company and the success that it had. And then, and then we're going to focus on the perspective of a freelance musician because that's mm-hmm. what most of the people are uh, here for to figure out, okay, what does this mean for me? But what were some of the things that as you look back, you could see as sort of universal principles, if you were to write a book on how to start a music production company in this space, what are the, some of the things that first come to mind as like this propelled us forward exponentially? Yeah, there's one thing and one thing that's very clear is our ambition to create music for brands was strictly an ambition to make amazing music. At the time, you would have people making music for brands and they would almost put on a different creative hat for that role and almost dumb down their own creative ambitions to make it work for advertising. And our biggest our biggest wins always, sorry, I'll rephrase it. I think one of our approaches to making music for brands was we're just making the music we want to hear. We're not going to try to cater to what we think an adver- advertiser wants. We're literally going to make an amazing piece of music. Yeah. And so very early on, we were making stuff that was, um, it stood out because, because, because of that fact, right? So, we were making music as if we were artists um, where a lot of other production companies at the time were making music that sounded like advertising music. Yeah. And that's one of the, the biggest, most important things creatively was like, don't park your best stuff for something down the road and, and do your mediocre stuff for, for advertising. It was really about, I'm putting my best foot forward. Um, this is title track on my album. And every time we set out to do something creatively, it was like, I have to be comfortable that whatever I create for this brand, I'd be willing to put it on my own record and put, yeah. put my name on it. That's, that's, that was really and important. If you, if you look at the, the time too, you rode that wave when real music became a thing in advertising. Like yes. almost like this traditional advertising jingle was like people were allergic to it and yeah. brands began realizing that the power of a real authentic track is the key to actually get through to someone at a time when like everything sounded like a damn jingle. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. So it's exactly you, right. Yeah. So you guys really sort of pioneered the whole real song rather yeah, than the real thing. Yeah. The real song is, is exactly what we wanted to actually create ourselves. Right. That yeah. was deep inside of us. It's like, we want to make this a real song. We want it to show up in an ad, but we want to, own that creatively saying we made that song and that's a big part of our success what did your kitchen look like in the early days and how did it involve and that's sort of my segue to how you work with musicians and 
um, how you made sure that these songs that you were creating were like really good. Who was doing that for you? Was it in-house writers or you, were you, uh, were you commissioning artists? How did you make it happen? Uh, really the first, um, group of creators were, was our network, right? We invited a lot of our musician friends into our circle and we were producing everything ourselves. So there was probably for a lot of it, there was probably five or six of us, um, producing everything and we were collaborating on everything. I think collaboration is the key to success in anything where you're basically that peer review is huge. So whether it's one or two people, that's where a lot of the bulk of our music in the early days got, got created. Um, the what we found thing is huge, man. Like I am, I'm into yeah. a lot of people now. I interviewed Catherine Joy yesterday. She's a film composer in LA. Um, it's funny, man. She said collaboration community. And I know we're oh, going to oh, yeah, talk about that because it's a big motive for your work today. But like, just write that word down, folks. Collaboration community. You're going to be much stronger in the context of a community than just trying to make it on your own. Keep going. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, no problem. So yeah, collaboration with users. There's, there's a core group of five of us. And what really grew our business, um, for better or for worse, was the idea that we thrived in this community. and so. Um, while well, a lot of the other houses were um, hiring outside composers to collaborate with on the music, we kept it all in house. So we built up our own community within our business. And at one point, I think we had 12 composers on staff. Wow. And so it was, it was a hive, man. Like it was, you know, here there's music in every room. That, that's what it was. And, and, you know, most of that was, um, servicing brands and film and television, but we just thrived on that. Like you get 10% away down an idea and then you walk down the hall and you're collaborating with someone or you're, um, you're working with someone to the point that, um, we mandated anybody working on a piece of music for us had to prove collaboration was involved or, um, you know, they had to work as a team because that's how you, that's how you know the product's going to be better. Yeah. It's so, so true. That was a, a big part of our processes in that, like everything had to be done in teams. And the thing is back then, I mean, you, you had to be in the same room literally in order to do it. Yes. The magic to that. But today the magic is that you could literally ship files over the internet. You could even record in real time. There are tools to do that, or though they're still kind of in the experimental phase and not. Oh yeah. We just did um, reliable, but great. Yeah. I was going to say, um, Grayson music just did a 30 person song camp. A 30, they got person ones, song camp? 30 person song camp with, with virtual rooms, five people in a room, all collaborating over you know 48 hours. There you um, go. Another one coming up with 40 people. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, really about collaboration and, and technology. And this pandemic has proved that people can get things done and embracing technology is, is huge. Yeah. And the practical example I can give for you of, of what the collaboration might look like is say that you're very good with, um, let's say, electronic music. And let's say that uh, you're working on some kind of a cinematic score. And the sort of thing that would become the, the secret sauce of the track would be some kind of a live performance, whether it's a vocal, a beautiful top line, or let's say you combine a beautiful violin solo with, you know, these cinematic electronics you got going on. Get somebody to lay down a damn violin solo. I mean, it's not even difficult these days get them, send them the track, get them to send it over to you, put it together or get someone to do a vocal. And now when you share that piece of music with somebody like Grayson or another music production company, it makes a world of a difference between what you could have done by yourself, which is just like sticking to your own tools and that extra dimension that, you know, partnering with somebody, somebody gives you. Um, what would you say is like the thing that you always looked for and continue to look for in musicians that may contact you and express interest in working with you? What separates those who actually make it into your circle and those who probably will not? Um, 
Well, you have to click with us as, as humans. You have to be um, a solid human being is the first step. And that's just in communication. And that's fairly simple enough to, to, to find people who are eloquent and communicate well and, and contact you in the right way. The second part of the, of the equation is really, you know, all of us have been in doing this long enough. I can hear the, I can hear talent in your ability to craft a melody or production pretty quickly. And I can tell you almost every person that was a staff composer in our organization came to us with a reel of some sort, a couple songs and, you know, unpolished, um, barely produced, but always there was a thread. You're like right there. See that little bit. Yeah. That's how, you know, they're, they're channeling something. They have, they have an ear for, for finding those hooks and those production styles that people want to hear. And so, um, that's really what it comes down to. So, but we can do it quickly. Like, it's funny. I can listen to a reel and within, you know, hearing the first five seconds of three or that's, four tracks. I'm like, yeah. That's yeah. the whole point folks. Yeah. So like when somebody shares their music with you, I mean, you're, you're a big chief now, so you probably are not fielding those emails, but like, let's say somebody writes to one of the producers at Grayson. Um, it's very likely that if it doesn't catch their attention in the first five seconds. Yeah. Yeah. You're the, the odds just keep going down from there. So that's something that we always say, you know, I wanted to mention something, man. I just, it just popped into my head. I remember I got in the business late. So it was like 2006 or so. And, um, I remember seeing this score and this sort of, almost like an audio logo for uh what was the what was the soda it was a soda it was five alive five alive was and five i alive? heard it and i was like fuck i'm quitting like the <laughs> thing was so good it, it was so beyond what was happening at the time and you guys were responsible for that yeah but it was so fresh and so good and so outrageous as far as like, even today, if you heard it, you'd be like, it's timeless. Yeah. But it was so outrageously on point as far as the brand and everything else that I just wanted to mention that, you know, I was just getting into business and I heard that and I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know how to do that. Like, you know, because when you hear something great, you're always like trying to engineer. Yeah. Like, okay. So yeah. could I do that? And in most cases I say, yeah, I could do that. And you know, 10 years later, could I do something like this? Sure. But like at the time, maybe I shouldn't even say that because it was so unique that I don't think anyone could replicate it. Like it was just one of a kind, you know, but I just wanted to mention that. Was well, that I, 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 I rem Yeah, that was a, that was a big spot because um, I remember the process there. You've not, we've never had more fun with um, an agency and a creative team working on that entire campaign. And we were big time experimenters. Like we never got in our head with the music. It was just literally about having fun and making music and finding interesting sounds and samples and, and just trying stuff. And that's a, an important part of the equation. You don't want to get too in your head when it comes to working for a brand. Like so many people that we work with, we're always trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong. And most important thing is that as an artist, um, composer, musician for anything, it's like you got to find your own voice and you got to stick to it. Because once you nail your voice, once you know your voice, you know your truth, you have no competition. If you're trying to analyze and mimic and analyze and mimic, you're not going to go anywhere. It's never going to be authentic. So what we were fortunate enough to have was we had, you know, those early days, the spot you're talking about. Um, there was five or six of us that had our own unique voice and we were willing to share that voice and it didn't matter whose voice showed up. We were just having fun. And, yeah. and that came about cause just playing and playing and playing. You're like, Oh my God, that's amazing. Do you, you still have a that. link to that spot? Cause I'd love to, sh I don't even know if you can find that thing. Yeah. It's funny. You've, you've, uh, I'm sure we could find it somewhere. Yeah. I'm sure it's an, cause it's, I, it's I would love for you to send archives. me a link to that. Uh, so I can post it inside of the masterclass like privately. Yeah. 
Sure. Um, just to give people the idea of like, because this, when, what was the year when that was produced? Say 2002, 2001, 2002. It's crazy. It's crazy. You guys yeah. can see it. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, it's, you've made me want to look it up right now while, while we're having this conversation. Yeah. I mean, but you know, the, the lesson in that spot is really like, there is no way that somebody who's overthinking and trying to figure out what this soft drink company wants, there is no way that they could have made this track come alive that way. It was literally like, you could tell that all seat belts were off. There was no holds bar barred. And the thing that comes out of the speaker is just so magical. And I'm really glad the brand and the agency went for it because a lot of times in our business, really oh, delightful yeah. things get cut first because the client is just scared that it's a bit too wild. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, it felt, we felt as um, composers and the agency creatives felt that they had slipped one by their, the brand, like the brand almost, you didn't, didn't even get it and it made it to air and everyone was like, how did that make it? Cause it was pretty out there. And we were very fortunate, but I, I can tell you that music was just because we were having fun. It wasn't, there was no analysis. We weren't trying to figure out anything. We were just having fun, purely coming from the heart and having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what do you think are some of the things that we can qualify as magic? Like in those first five seconds, when you're listening to something, just want to like pick your brain for what kind of things, um, sort of, you know, separate themselves in your mind when you listen to reels or demos, is it a voice? Is it instrumentation? Is it sounds? I have to say it's, it's all the above. Um, you know, I listen for lots of different things. I listen for composition and melody. I listen for production because in our world, we're looking for everything. Um, and so we got very good at, at, at hearing those little earworms from a variety of genres, whether it's orchestral or R&B hip hop or rock or sound design. You just, you just know when something has a little sonic hook that, 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 yeah. that catches your ear and you want, you want to, you want more. Yeah. Um, so we cut our teeth on so many different genres that we got good at just hearing those things um, and, and hearing craft very quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I'm obsessed with um, sound and mix and, and I love hearing sounds that sound that come out of you know, things that I've never heard before. Yeah. I can even hear sound effects from libraries all over the place, right? And that's another thing. When, when you hear familiar patches or sounds and you go, oh, like I can even hear the sound of an Ableton auto filter. I'm like, oh, there's auto filter going crazy. So uh, that's another thing you got to be aware of it that if you're using a lot of off the shelf stuff, if you're not pushing that creativity, um, guys like me will hear it. Yeah. Um, producers yeah. will hear it and go, Oh, he's using this and he's doing that. And I see he's doing there. And, and yeah. sometimes when you get uh, something completely original, you kind of lean in and go, what the hell are you doing there? How do you do that? Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Cause uh, I also uh, interviewed uh, this guy, Tim K. He's a creative director. At butter in LA. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's an accomplished artist and songwriter in his own right. But like the thing he really talked about is the sound design. Like how does it sound, you know? And, yeah. um, it's so important in, in, in the commercial space folks, like just because you can create a cool chord progression and record it on your guitar or piano, like that's not rare anymore. A lot of people can do that. So what is rare is like really dialing in a certain sound that gives people a certain like, huh, what was that, you know? And I think um, that's very, very important skill to develop. What do you think is the future or like the thing that people should think about if they're a freelance musician considering this space? What are the things they need to get in order uh, in order to succeed today and in the future in, in this business? Um, it's um, persistence. Um, it's also about developing relationships. Um, it's also the world of brand content is now spread out. I mean, when we started, it was 
uh, radio and television. And we didn't bother with radio because television was so lucrative. But there was, you know, a select handful of channels and everyone made TV commercials. And there it was. Yeah. The future is content is everywhere. But at the same time, so is music. So music is really easily accessible. So um, just being able to make music is really only half the battle. Um, a ton of people can make great sounding music and you can find music a lot all over the place. It's really about developing relationships, knowing how to service a client. Cause that's the thing about brand world. It happens quickly. It happens, um, at a high level and the level of service is really important. So you're really collaborating with an agency and a brand. And that's a skill set that has to be developed along with the craft of the music. Yeah. You know, me and you have talked at length, so many people, there's, countless number of people that can make music as well as you or I or anyone work with. But you have to add on top of that, that skill of being a collaborator, yeah. an amazing human, an entertainer, a person who knows how to service someone and really be able to collaborate efficiently to like meet the needs of an agency and then a brand on top of that. That's, that's really a huge part of this effort. Music's really the first step. Um, that says, okay, I can make the music. Now, how do I collaborate with someone? How do we work together? How do we, how do we hit a home run together? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's so important. I think these relationships, you know, it's something I keep talking about. It's the quality of you as a person, not just as a musician, that's going to be the determining factor in the quality of your relationships and like the level that you're able to get to, you know, there is a reason why people gravitate to each other in certain circles and at certain levels. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, industry professionals, for example, guys like us, you know, we were introduced by an industry friend, a client of yeah. ours, actually a create a former creative director of an agency, one of the best in Canada. And so we met over dinner and it just so happened that we had a great conversation, you and I, even though like yeah. you could consider us competitors, but it's funny how you don't even talk about it when you connect with somebody else. And like, I noticed the best people in the business, they don't talk about competition. They actually get together for beers to talk about the industry. How is it going? You know, what do you see happening? And so they're supporting one another. So that's hugely important. Um, yeah, I'll second, second that to further what I was saying too and what you're saying is um, when you develop a relationship with, with someone that is very collaborative and um, mutually beneficial, the music's always going to get made and you're always going to be happy with it and the client's always going to be happy with it because you're working on it together. Yeah. Um, so many times we've worked with artists who are, you know, they'll send something in and we'll ask, we got to change this client wants to change this. And they put their foot down. It's like, no, that's not, I, I don't want to do that creatively. I don't like that. It's like, well, that's just really not what we're doing here. We're, we're always collaborating. We're always working to an end goal together. Um, yeah. You have to be able to do that really efficiently. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a bit about um, this signal thing you're doing. Um, so you've, you've been successful as a music production company still going after all these years and then you suddenly decide you want to embark on this new ambitious project where you're going to make your studio space available to musicians you're going to take this collaboration concept to a whole new level and just open it up to to the public talk to me about signal and and what that is yeah so um i'm really excited about signal and watching it grow but signal is effectively after two decades of working in the business, working my ass off in the business, it was about, okay, what's the next step for me in my career? And, you know, realizing that one of my core truths is to, is how I pass on knowledge to next generation of creators. I spent so much time nurturing creatives through the process of working that I developed, you know, a lot of heart and a lot of knowledge around how do I support younger people to accelerate their ability to perform, create way faster than I did. Like it took, you know, I fumbled around in the dark figuring this all out. Um, Same with me. And so I was like, how do I create a model to accelerate the process for people at scale? So the first thing that we did was we had this massive facility um, 
that's effectively a nine to five shop. And like, there was so much unused capacity. I said, can't we bring the community of people we work with and the community at large and build, bring them into the space um, around a more collaborative model. So more people, more energy, more collaboration. Um, so it's a real estate model uh, that involves people being able to pay for memberships to access physical uh, facilities, but then a, a built-in community. So really that's the stepping stone for me to create an at-scale platform that can help creators accelerate their potential. And, so I'm a, um, musician, learn- I'm a musician in Toronto and yeah. I want to be a part of this collaborative community thing. So basically I pay you a membership fee and then what I have access to like professional studios and other yeah, so, options. Yeah. So our, um, the, it's a simple application process um, for a membership and the base membership is free. We invite you into our community because we want you in our community. So there's a bit of an application process and then you get access to facilities that you book um, whenever you want and you pay for them the same way you would an hourly rate for studio. But then obviously you, you have, you get access to a whole layer of community benefits between curated our curated events programming. Um, obviously you get access to the community that's already there. Um, companies from all different verticals um, in our community right now, we've got, Uh, major publishers, major labels, obviously commercial production, television production, podcast production companies. And what I realized early on is, wow, there's a whole world of content that needs music and sound. And now I've spent two decades touching so many of them. Why not bring them all together, you know, in one unified way, physically and virtually. Under one roof. Yeah. And then create that or for people even than they were before. But our, our big goal is to, to be virtual and be global. Um, you know, we've been talking to many different cities about this uh, physical model that's been supported by a digital platform. Okay, gotcha. Um, I'm going to link to that um, below our interview so people can check it out. Do you have any uh, parting words of advice for folks who are listening, who are ambitious, who are working on their craft, and like the first things that come to your mind and your good conscience that you would share with them? Uh, first and foremost, understand that we are all creatives. Um, we all have the ability to perform at a very high level, to do amazing things. It's really about a mindset and setting yourself towards a purpose and a goal and, and going towards it. Uh, it's really easy to fall into that self judgment mode. Like you mentioned, and when you saw that five alive commercials, like I can't do that. We all are inherently creators. We all have the potential to be anything we want to be. So it's really a matter of head down work ethic, find those goals and find your, your true creative voice. Cause when you're speaking from your truth and your heart, you have no competition and, and you will find success. And that's for me, one of the important things is to, to really convey the idea that everyone is capable. Technology is now off the table. Anyone can get technology. When I started, technology was a prerequisite. It was a limiter, yeah. Yeah, and it's gone. So now now that's not an excuse anymore. It's literally just your creativity, your, 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 your innate abilities as a creator can now shine without any impediment. So just a matter of attacking, nothing stopping you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dave, thanks so much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. I uh, hope this has been inspiring and helpful to you guys listening. And uh, uh, I'm going to link to Grayson below so you can take a look at their reel, use it as a standard to judge your work and what you need to do to bridge that gap. And I'm also going to link to um, Signal Creative Community for those of you who are in Toronto, because I know we have a few Toronto students who, uh, yeah, you should check it out and you should join because as you heard today, um, create creativity, collaboration, community are the things that really make a difference in the long run for any craft person. So thanks very much, Dave. Appreciate this, man. All the best to you and the family. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been awesome.